Well, hey there, native plant enthusiasts. This is Santino, Education Coordinator for Bowman's Wildflower Preserve, coming at you with a quick introduction to today's video. Uh, before we get started today, I want to take a quick, quick moment and just say thank you to each and every one of you for your constant and unending support of this content. Um, I was thrilled to wake up this morning and find that we have reached our 300th subscriber to our YouTube channel, um, which is kind of mind-boggling to me um, and, and truly humbling. So it is, it is wonderful and thrilling to be part of a community that understands how important these native plants are to not only the world, um, but each and every one of us. Uh, and, and yeah, so I, I can't thank you enough from the bottom of my heart, from everyone here at the Preserve. Um, as always, please keep on continuing to like, share, subscribe, comment, all of those things. Um, because, yeah, as you all are well aware, right, native plants are the cornerstone of every healthy ecosystem. So, as always, I want to encourage each and every one of you to place your own native plant cornerstone and help us construct a healthy and vibrant world for all. Um, yeah. So, anyway, thank you. Thank you again and on to today's video. Today, we're gonna do a follow-up to our previous video, which was butterfly weed. If you haven't had a chance to check that one out yet, I highly recommend that you do so. I'll have it linked somewhere here, or it might just be the end card. Um, so today, we're gonna focus on members of the dogbane family, which include both dogbane and milkweed. And I'm here at the South Meadow, one of two meadows that will greet you as you enter the preserve, um, as that's one of the great places to see all three of the species I wanna highlight here today. Now, the family name for dog bane stems from the Greek, which means dog away, as many members of this uh, species were used to poison dogs uh, historically, because of course they are toxic. Um, many folks are familiar with the toxicity of milkweed as its relation to the monarch butterfly. If you might remember from taxonomy, humans love to group things that have similar characteristics, so all members of this family or of this group can take to contain toxins that exude a milky latex sap if damaged. Um, in addition, these sap and toxins are the plant's natural defense to prevent other organisms from eating them. Um, again, as I said, you might remember this from the monarchs and milkweed, the monarch caterpillar feeding on the milkweed plant, um, taking up those toxins, making it uh, toxic for other wildlife to eat. So those two species benefiting from that toxin. So one of the first plants you'll see as you enter our meadow is going to be the hemp dogbane, which is an upright perennial uh, with opposite branching. And of course it exudes a milky sap if damaged. The flowers are five pointed bells, which form in clusters. The leaves are opposite, just like the branching. And historically dogbane was used for a variety of purposes. Uh, the fibers of the stalks were used uh, as a tough, durable cordage, and the seeds can be ground into a powder and used for food. Um, the latex sap that's exuded from this plant was also historically turned into a chewing gum, though personally I would not recommend it. Um, given how toxic these, these uh, compounds are. Um, presently, dogbane is used as a form of remediation as it readily takes up lead from the environment. So uh, that's another great, great use of it. Next up is butterfly weed, which you might remember from our previous video. You can find that both here in the meadow as well as up the hill in our visitor center garden. Uh, now, it's an upright perennial milkweed, often bushy, with several stems arising from the base. The flowers typically form in terminal umbels, which is the term used to describe the umbrella-like clusters of stalks arising from a single tip of the stem. The flowers may be many shades of orange and range from orange to red, and sometimes you'll see them as a yellow. Um, unlike other milkweeds, if you remember from our previous video, the sap of this species is not as toxic as others, uh, so it is not the preferred source of many caterpillars. Um, just for that matter of fact, it doesn't provide the same level of defense. So lastly, I wanna talk about common milkweed. I'm gonna put a lot of focus on the common milkweed, which again, you can find here at the meadow. Um, it's a sturdy, upright perennial plant with broad leaves and milky sap, and this is kind of the the plant that you imagine when you think of seeing milkweed along the side of the highway. Um, it blooms from May through August, 
with clusters of pink to lilac flowers. Um, fertilized flowers will then form into pods, milkweed pods, which when dry will split open to release hundreds and hundreds of seeds. Each of these seeds has a uh, parachute of sorts, um, a white silky hair that is attached to them. This is referred to as the floss, and that helps disperse the seeds as they are carried on the wind. More than 450 different insect species feed on Asclepia sirica, um, which is the scientific name for the common milkweed. This includes flies, beetles, ants, bees, wasps, and of course, butterflies. Uh, many people are already aware of the relationship between the common milkweed and the monarch butterfly, um, and the vital importance that the milkweed plays for the monarch being the host plant for those species. Um, in 2018, the CEO of the National Wildlife Federation stated that in the last 20 years, a reduction of milkweed is the likeliest and largest contributing factor to a decline in monarch population, which has decreased more than 90%. Um, now, while the monarch butterfly might not serve as an economic uh, role for us humans in our society, um, it serves as a vibrant ecological champion and an indicator species, and declines in the monarch population um, are also likely going to be mirrored and, you know, by those other pollinators as well that do serve a economic role for us. So that's one of the reasons why we should be concerned. Now, the latex uh, sap of the milkweed contains a large quantity of cardiac glycoside, which is the toxic compound within that sap. Um, the adult plants are toxic to humans as well as other large animals, so it's very much recommended to not try to ingest them. Um, the monarch caterpillar has a long evolutionary relationship with this plant, meaning that you know it's grown accustomed to and is not bothered by these, but it serves as a great defense when the caterpillar ingests them, takes up the toxins, and then tries to be eaten by other wildlife um, and makes those other wildlife sick. However, the young shoots of milkweed, um, including the leaves and flower buds, are all edible, although I would not recommend uh, trying that yourself. Now, common milkweed has played several roles in our society. The fluff of the hairs, uh, or floss, as you might remember, have been used for the traditional background mounting of a variety of insect species, including butterflies. Uh, the Native Americans used to use it for both cordage uh, as well as textiles, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture um, did some studies in the 1890s as well as the 1940s and found that common milkweed uh, has the most potential for commercial processing of any native fibrous plant. Uh, they compared the yield to things like hemp as well as flax. Now, during the height of World War II, the Asclepius played a major role in our culture. Um, in fact, sayings like, two bags save one life and don't let our sailors sink were quite common. Uh, the floss, being naturally water resistant as well as buoyant, they were collected and used to stuff life preservers. Traditionally, the fibrous material called kapok, which surrounds the seeds of the kapok tree, were used for this purpose. However, military occupation of the Java Islands, or Java, during that war, all but eliminated our source of these fibers. Without any access to the critical fibers from the kapok tree, the U.S. turned to our own abundant native plant resource. Uh, Dr. Boris Berkman, a Chicago physician and inventor, introduced the idea of milkweeds being used as filler in March of 1942. Extensive tests by the U.S. Navy showed that little over a pound of milkweed could keep a 150-pound man floating for nearly 40 hours, and of the 20 plus different milkweed species in North America, it was the common milkweed, uh, Asclepia sirica, that was most often sought after. It was crucial for processing that the pods be picked when they were ripe, but not yet fully open. It took approximately two full sacks, or about 20 pounds of ripe pods, to produce enough floss for one life jacket. Um, initially, Cash payments were set up on a per pound basis, $50 per ton. Um, and of course that was then converted to a per bag payment system at 15 cents for one fresh picked bag of pods and 20 cents if you dried the pods in advance. 
At the preserve, you can find several other different milkweed species depending on the time of the year. This includes world, poke, uh, as well as swamp milkweed. So each species, of course, having its own habitat preference. Um, so no matter what your garden looks like, there's likely a milkweed species that will fit for you. Remember, we want to help all of our pollinators, so I encourage you all to continue uh, planting native in your own garden. So it was during the editing process that I realized I missed discussing the interesting pollination in milkweed, and it's far too cool not to share. So unlike many flowers, the pollen of milkweeds is clumped into a sticky, waxy packet called the pollinia. These pollinia are housed inside a chamber that's accessed through a slit formed by the fusion of the anthers. Uh, a visiting insect trying to reach the nectar offered at the top of the flower will inadvertently slip one of its legs into one of these slits, and as the insect pulls its leg out of the slit, it also extracts the sticky pollinia, which is then carried on to the next flower that it feeds on. The process repeats, leading to successful pollination if the pollinia from the first flower remains in the anther slit of the second. Now sometimes an insect might get its leg stuck in the slit and not be strong enough to pull it out. So careful milkweed observers can sometimes spot the dead bodies or lost limbs of insects who fell victim to the sweet allure of the milkweed's nectar. All right, that just about wraps it up for me today. Um, I wanna thank each and every one of you for your continued support of the preserve. And remember, if you are enjoying these videos, please hit the subscribe button as well as the like button down below um, and comment. Let us know what you learned, what you like, what you love, and any recommendations you have for future plants for future videos. Um, of course, sharing these videos are a great and free way to help the preserve and spread the message of the importance of native plants to all life on earth. And without further ado, as always, I want to encourage each and every one of you to keep on experiencing what's natural and learn what's native. Take care, everyone. Bye.